Hey guys, Alan here, Solid Rock Bible Class. Uh, glad you're with me, and uh, we're staying down the line of don't forget to remember. Beautiful morning out, isn't it? Um, but we're going to be talking about don't procrastinate. Probably one of my worst habits here. I love to put things off, you know, and why do today what you can put off till tomorrow? But uh, we're going to be talking about this in a couple of realms. So one of the realms I want us to really consider is if we haven't accepted Christ as our personal Savior, procrastinating can be very deadly. But at the same time, I want to talk about down a different angle, and I'm going to mix these up just a little as we're going through it. But procrastination, as far as doing what God has called us to do, is also dangerous. And we need to be very careful about that, that we take and really listen to God's leading here. You know, uh, I, I ran into a, an outline, a business outline a while back at, that kind of maybe kind of started me on this journey of looking at this. And uh, I'll just, it had four main points and I'm only gonna hit those briefly. But it says, treat today like it's your last day. I think that's really wise. Act like today is the only day you have and when you go to bed tonight, it's all over with. What would you do? How would you conduct your life? Point number two they had on it is not every battle that's worth fighting. If everything feels urgent, you'll probably just absolutely never win. So we need to learn to focus where God wants us to focus in our lives. Also, don't ha just halfway keep your commitments. You're only as good as what your word is, and you need to keep your commitments. And then the fourth point is, you know, get clear on what is non-negotiable within your life. And I think that is a really important piece of what we're going to be talking about. We're really going to be talking about point one and point four, I guess you could say. You know, treat today like it's your last day. And be clear on what's not negotiable within your life. Procrastination is something that can be extremely negative within our lives. So I'm going to start out, I probably have more scripture in this one that I've had in a long time. I'm going to be jumping all over the place. Hope you have your Bibles with you. And uh, we're going to start out in the book of First John. I'm sorry, in the book of John, not the book of First John, but the book of John. The third chapter, third verse. We need to remember, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Very, very big principle here as we, we look at God's word. There's only one way to salvation. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our only hope of salvation. We need to remember that and apply that to our lives. If we're a Christian, we need to remember not everybody's going to heaven. We need to remember that we need to fulfill what God has given us here on earth so that we influence as many people as possible. We're going to talk about that probably a little bit more later, but we are called to be influencers. I don't even think I knew what the word influencer really meant maybe 10 years ago. And now you've got them all over the internet. These people that are influencers and they make their living by being influencers and guess what? God has called us to be influencers. We are to influence people so that they will accept Christ as their personal Savior. Remember back in the book of Acts, you have Philip, and I'm not going to read this entire passage. I'm going to jump through the passages here just a little bit. But Philip is in this revival meeting, and God comes and speaks to him. It's in Acts 8, chapter, verses 26 through 39. And uh, the angel takes and speaks to Philip, saying, Arise, go towards the south unto the way that goeth, to, goeth down from Jerusalem into Gaza, which is in the desert. He calls him out of this revival meeting, and he says, I need you to go do something. And, and we notice that Philip, he took and he followed that leading of the Holy Spirit. In verse 27, he says, And he arose and he went. And all of a sudden, he sees this man from Ethiopia. He's riding in a chariot. He's reading the Bible here. And um, he's a very influential man in Ethiopia. 
And notice in verse number 28, he was returning and setting in his chariot, and he, he read the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And of course, Isaiah, the prophet, has so much to say about Christ's coming. And then notice God speaks to Philip again. He's already spoke with him up in verse 26. Now he speaks with him in verse 29 again, and he says, Then the Spirit, of, Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, join yourself to this chariot. We look a little bit further as we look through it, and and we see that Philip did that. And here is probably one of the big key verses I want us to look at, which is verse 31. We have a man <clears throat> who's reading the Bible. He's thinking, he's pondering. And Philip asks him the question, do you know what, you, what you're reading in verse 30? In verse 31, he said, here's, the, here's the thing that is said. He says, and he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? Guess what? We're called to be influencers. Because eternity is at stake here. Eternity for people of whether they go to heaven or hell is at stake. And we're called to influence people. We can't force people, but we are called to influence people. And we see later in the passage, of course, that he, he took and he talked to him about the scriptures. He's saved. We see that he's baptized. But that one phrase how can, can i how can i understand this except some man should guide me we're called to do that remember the fact that being called to be this influencer god's very clear and we look in john the 15th chapter verse 16 notice it says ye have not chosen me but I have chosen you. And he goes on and he says, and ordained you that you should bring forth fruit. We are called to bring forth fruit. And then he says, this fruit should remain. It's going to stick around. So we are called to do this as Christians. Why are we called to do this? Because eternity is at stake for many people that have not, not accepted Christ as our personal Savior. We are called to take and bring this faith to a lost and dying world. It's our job. In John, the ninth chapter, verse 4, he says, The night is coming when no man can work. Guess what? There's a time coming when we can't influence people anymore. And maybe the scary part is there's a time coming when they can't be influenced anymore. But God has clearly told us in the book of Luke, 10th chapter, verse 2, the harvest is truly great, but the labors are few. There's not a lot of people that are standing in line to do the job for God here. Many people say, you know, um, the Bible's way, it's just too archaic. It doesn't work. We have different methods now because we're in the 21st century. But you know what? God's way, it still does work. When we look at Psalms 126 chapter, verses 5 and 6, he says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Notice it doesn't just say sow. Sow in tears. Talking about something compassionate here. And then in verse 6 here, in one, Psalms 126 and 6, he says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bringing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with me. We are guaranteed success. Now everybody's success will be different, but we're guaranteed success. We, remember, we also know here that... that um, people's hearts, they are going to be hardened. There's a hardness of the heart. And people, when their hearts are hardened, it's more difficult to get to them. But there's certain times in their life that we can reach them. There's certain times when all of a sudden God speaks to a person more. In Proverbs, the 29th chapter, verse 1, he says, he that is 
often reproof hardeneth his neck shall be destroyed suddenly and that without remedy. So you can't really take and be influenced by God's word and have it not affect your heart. When we read God's word, when we study God's word, when, when, when people are exposed to God's word, nothing remains the same. We can also see that in the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 12, where he says, for the word of God, it's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. Notice that God's word affects people. When we look into the book of Acts, the second chapter, verses 37 and verse 38, notice how people's lives are affected when they're, when they're exposed to God's word. It says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and they said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In verses 38, then Peter said unto them, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, that ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice that people's lives are affected when they're exposed to God in God's word. And we have opportunities, there's no question we have opportunities, but we have to remember that with these opportunities, life is short. We don't have forever. In Job, the 14th chapter, verse 1, it says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. In verse 2, it says, He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow. Notice, life is short. We can't just boast about tomorrow. We don't have any promise of tomorrow. When we look at James, the fourth chapter, it says, he says, go to now, ye that said, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. In verse 14, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what's your life? It's even a vapor. It appears for a little time, then it vanishes away. So we see that we're kind of like the grass or kind of like a flower that once it's cut, it withers rapidly. Or we're just like a little bit of steam that goes up and all of a sudden just disappears. Life is short. We have no promise of tomorrow. And he reminds us of that also in Proverbs, the 27th chapter, verse 1. He says, Boast not thyself of the morrow, for thou knowest not what the day may bring forth. No promise of another opportunity. We don't have it. And we can only, people can only be saved when the Spirit is drawing them. And the Bible says that God's Spirit, it's not going to always take and strive with man. So where do we put our priorities? Because in Matthew, the 16th chapter, it says in verse 26, for what's it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Now, as Christians, we have to remember we're trying to influence people for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, it's kind of a scary thought here because the window of opportunity, it's not always gonna be open. And we have no promise of tomorrow. And then here he says, what's it profit you to just gain everything and then die and go to hell? I think there's a lot of people that are exchanging their soul for, for, for just a few pleasures today. In, um, Luke, the 12th chapter, there's a, a really good story here. And I'm just, again, not, I'm just going to brief the story because uh, of the fact that uh, 
I don't want to have to spend all the time reading it here. But uh, in Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 15, there's a man here that he took and he's, he's been very, very prosperous. And uh, Jesus, it says, and he spake a parable in them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plenty. I think all of us know the story. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? Because I have no room to bestow my fruits. And we see that he takes and he tears down his barns, he builds bigger barns and he sets back in verse 19 and he says, I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, be merry. And then we see God speaks to him in verse 20. He says, but God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then shall, where shall these things be? Can't take them with us, can we? The hearse doesn't have a U-Haul coming behind it. We can't take it with us. We also need to remember as Christians and also somebody that hasn't accepted Christ as a personal savior that not living a godly life the way the Bible takes and portrays it to us, it'll shorten our life. In Proverbs 29 chapter verse one, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall be destroyed suddenly without remedy. We already talked about that particular verse here, but putting off salvation, it invites destruction. We look into Proverbs 28, chapter verse 18. It says, whosoever walketh uprightly shall be saved, but he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. Shall suddenly die, you say. We look again in Proverbs and in the 10th chapter, verse 27. He says, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days. To live by God's direction, it actually lengthens our days. Definite warning to those that are, that are not saved. And then here's the part that I said I was coming back around to. And it's about us influencing people. It's important that we influence people and we influence people the right way. Because if when we procrastinate, when we do that, our influence is actually destroyed. In Romans, the 14th chapter, verse seven, for none of us that liveth to himself, I'm sorry, let me start over. For none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. Regardless of who you are, think about this, no matter who you are, you influence people. You say, I don't influence people, nobody listens to me. Yeah, they actually do. There's somebody that listens to you. Maybe it's parents to children, maybe it's brothers to sisters, maybe it's just friends among themselves. It may be people in leadership, it may be successful people, it may be popular people, but it may not be. Do you remember the rich man in hell? Luke the 16th chapter and verse 27. It says, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house. You know, I was thinking about this story and, and remember that the story in Luke the 16th chapter, the Bible says it is a real story. It's not a parable. It says a certain rich man. And we see this, this one rich man, he had somebody that was just a beggar that laid at his gate that influenced him. He didn't listen to him, but he influenced him. And notice we find that the rich man is in hell, which has nothing to do with his economic state. It has everything to do with his spiritual state. And we see that Lazarus, who's a beggar, all of a sudden we see him in Abraham's bosom or in heaven. And we see that the rich man is begging Lazarus to take, or Father Abraham here, to take and allow Lazarus to go and speak 
to his brothers, his sisters, those that, are, those that he knows, so they won't come to this terrible place where he's at. Again, I'll read that verse. It says, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Notice, Lazarus influenced this man. He didn't take heed. He didn't listen. But he did influence him. And he felt that he couldn't possibly influence his brothers and his sisters. Now, we do know that the... But the, how the story ends here that, you know, that, of course, Lazarus can't go back and talk to his brothers and sisters. But notice he influenced people. We are called to influence people for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can't procrastinate influencing people for Jesus. This is Alan. Hope you have a great weekend. I'll catch you later.